Welcome everyone to our presentation on brain health. I am super excited that you all are here. I am absolutely blessed to have you in my presence. I know that there were countless things that you could be doing with your time. So I want to congratulate you on choosing to be here and choosing to be proactive about your brain health. Before any further, I would like to first tell you a little bit about me. My name is Dr. Michelle Gamble, and I am an integrative wellness mentor. And what that means is that I, I wear a lot of different hats. I really believe in the old fashioned meaning of the word doctor, which is that I am first and foremost a teacher, an educator. I've been an educator for over 25 years. And so I bring in several different hats. I'm a clinical consultant with several different certifications in various areas of health, both physical, mental, emotional, spiritual health. I'm also very much a proponent of classroom instruction, so welcome to my classroom today. I believe in compassionate care that goes beyond all concepts of restrictions and boundaries because it's important that we love and care for each other. I believe in creative coaching and more than anything else, I believe in being there for those who need to be heard as your consistent and constant confidant. Now, you may be asking yourself, why do I have a medical disclaimer? I have a medical disclaimer because I am not a medical doctor. And I love the fact that I'm not a medical doctor because I do not treat or diagnose or cure any form of disease. And I have no intentions of doing any of that today. This presentation is not a replacement for your one-on-one -on -one relationship with your medical provider, and it is not medical advice. It is intended to be a sharing of the information that I've gathered from my experience as a consultant, as a healer, and from my research, and also from the experts who have contributed to this particular presentation. I encourage you to make your own healthcare decisions with participation from all the different members of your healthcare team. Now, you may be wondering, why is brain health so important to me? I wanna begin by asking you, did you know that at least one in five adults experience a mental health concern? One in 10 young people experience a period of major depression, in fact, one of the most alarming statistics that I have learned is that the second leading cause of death in our children from ages 10 to 25 is suicide. One in 25 people live with a serious mental illness such as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. And at least a half of Americans experience some form of mental instability or mood imbalance at some point in life. So if any of these statistics apply to you, know that you are not alone. And many people think that personality weakness or character flaws cause mental illness. Some people think that people with mental needs, even those who are managing their illness, cannot tolerate the stress of holding down a job. Even very young children may show warning signs of mental health concerns, and that is why I'm doing this because the picture that you see in front of you is the picture of my son. And the reason why this means so much to me is because he has recently been diagnosed with mental illness and gone through periods of psychosis. And you know, the funny thing is that this is not new to me and our family, meaning my adoptive daughter is a person with disability, but it was different for her because you know, She's been like that all of her life. And for my son, it was something that appeared to me to be out of the blue. But tonight, I'm going to share with you that there are certain warning signs that you can see months or sometimes even years before the straw breaks the camel's back. And that is why this is important to me. It is important to me for you to be empowered with this information to help you because as I said, I guarantee that someone 
in your family or someone in your community is struggling with a brain illness at this point in time. So let's begin with thinking about what is the brain? For so many years through millennia, it's been a mystery. And the state of our mental health affects how we think, feel, act, and influences our emotional, psychological, and social well being. Now, the factors that contribute to mental health include things such as biological factors, such as your genes, your brain chemistry, your lifestyle choices, nutrition, drugs alcohol, your life experiences, such as trauma or abuse, and your family history, whether or not people in your family have had mental illnesses or mental problems. Now, we're going to start by looking at what is the brain, because the reality is that mental health begins with brain health. And unfortunately, in our world and in our country, it is phenomenal to me that our psychiatrists do not address the health of the brain. They are the only medical professionals that are allowed to quote unquote practice medicine without looking at the brain that they're supposed to be treating. That is why I want you to know this information so that if you are ever in a situation where someone that you love has a brain illness, you're able to strategically interpret the data and challenge your medical professionals to address the holistic causes or possible causes of the imbalances that you see manifest as a mental illness. Now, the brain is an organ that acts as the main control center of our bodies. This complex organ controls your intelligence, your senses, your body movement, and your behavior. Your brain weighs approximately three pounds, making up about 2% of your body weight. And within the past 10 years, we've begun to understand more about the brain than past centuries combined. The brain can be divided into three sections. And we're going to talk about those three sections today. The forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. Now, how much do you know about the brain's anatomy? Let's take a deeper look at each section. Now, keep in mind that mental health is more than just the absence of some kind of illness. It is a positive sense of well-being and the capacity to enjoy life and handle life's challenges gracefully, with ease. Mental health, just like physical health, is influenced by numerous factors, including, as I said, your life experiences, our work environment, our community environment. So, for instance, now we're in this whole zone of, quote, unquote, um, social distancing. I want you to think about the effect that this is having on the brain and on the connections and the wirings in the brain and therefore how it affects all the different aspects of your body and how it shapes your life. Now, the three primary parts of the brain are the cerebrum, the cerebellum, and the brainstem. The cerebrum is divided into four lobes, the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, and the occip occipital lobe. The cerebrum is the largest part of the brain and is composed of the right and the left hemispheres. Now, when we look at the forebrain, otherwise known as the cerebrum, we're looking at the frontal lobe, which holds the memories that allow you to plan and imagine and think. And then we're also talking about the parietal lobes that translate your senses, such as touch, vision, hearing, and speech, and reasoning, and emotions. And it is important for spatial orientation and navigation. The temporal lobe processes sound and language and houses the hippocampus and the amygdala, which plays roles in memories and emotions, respectively. 
And last but not least, the occipital lobe is, lo is responsible for visual processing and it helps you to recognize your friends and read books. Now, the most important thing that I want to impress upon you here is the relationship between what is called the amygdala, which houses your memories, and in particular, fear, and the prefrontal cortex, your executive functioning. Now, the reason why I'm emphasizing this is especially in these times, these questionable times that we are in, what tends to be stimulated more than anything else in the brain is the amygdala. And the amygdala hijacks the frontal cortex, the cerebral cortex, where your executive functioning is supposed to happen, where you're supposed to be able to logically understand and comprehend and process things. That is why it is so key that we learn how to, what I call hijack, the amygdala hijack, meaning how to dissipate the intensity of the amygdala hijack in order to ensure more positive processing of your environment and of your life. Now, the midbrain, also known as the brainstem, relays the information between the brain and the rest of the body. This is in charge of automatic functions such as breathing, heart rate, body temperature, and things of that nature. The hindbrain, otherwise known as the cerebellum, coordinates your muscle movements, your motor control, and helps you to maintain your posture and your balance. Now, as I said, the cerebral cortex is where most information is actually processed in the brain. Now, another thing that we look at is what's called the interplay between the left and the right hemispheres of the brain. The left hemisphere of the brain is known for logical, analytical, objective thinking. It includes things such as your language, logic, critical thinking, numbers, and reasoning. Whereas the right hemisphere of the brain is said to be more intuitive, more thoughtful, more subjective, and the traits of the right hemisphere of the brain include things such as facial recognition, emotional recognition, music, reading, color, imagination, intuition, and creativity. Now, let's talk a little bit about some of the imbalances that we may observe in ourselves or in our loved ones. Depression comes in many forms, ranging from temporal or situational to lifelong battles, and symptoms can be mild to debilitating. Chances are that you or someone you know has experienced some sort of depression. Over 15 million Americans struggle with depression annually. Depression can come in many different forms, but typically involves repetitive negative looping, a bleak outlook and lack of energy. Depressive disorders are complex, involving many systems of the body and includes the immune system. That is why, again, I stress to you, as we go through this presentation, to think about the people in your life and to really consider any signs that you may see of any type of imbalance, because it is so key to be able to provide that person with help before it is too late. There are tons of evidence linking diet and mental health issues such as depression. So again, we have to look at things holistically and realize that everything impacts mental health from the hormones that race through your body to your immune system, the foods that you eat, the TV that you look at, all of these horrible news shows that are designed to trigger anxiety and fear and tension and drama in your life. A number of studies have found that omega-3 fatty acids may be beneficial in the treatment of mild to moderate depression. And it, you know, this is important to note again, because 
especially in times of chaos and confusion, we don't eat properly. We eat exactly the foods that increase the likelihood of mental imbalances. I've heard that during the corona pandemic, the consumption of alcohol has gone through the roof. It has increased by over 500%. Can you imagine how that is affecting our people emotionally, mentally, spiritually, physically, not to mention the effect that it is having on the immune system? And as you go through the stores, you don't see people loading up on vegetables and fruits to build their system, to build their immunity. No, you see them loading up on little Debbies and crackers and chips and, and ho-hos and ding-dongs and cookies and candies. Exactly the elements that further debilitate us and further create imbalances within our mental condition. And that, as we said before, affects our immune system. Now, by incorporating fish into the diet several times a week, you may help to offset the tendency for things such as depression. Omega-3 foods include sardines, salmon, herring, trout, canned white albacore tuna, and supplements can be a good substitute as well. But keep in mind that not all, subs not all supplements are created the same. Omega-3 fatty acids contain free fatty acids and phospholipids. And keep in mind that you can also get non-fish derived omega-3 supplements. Plant sources such as soy, walnuts, canola oil, chia, flax, hemp seeds, also contain omega-3 fatty acids. In fact, flax oil is something that I often use to supplement omega fatty acids for people who are vegetarians. Now, let's think about why brain health is so important. A healthy brain functions quickly and automatically. And one in five people in the United States suffers from a neurological disorder. Such diseases afflict the brain, the spine, and the nerves connecting them. The National Institute of Neurological Disorders report the following common disorders. Neurogenic diseases such as Huntington's disease and muscular dystrophy, developmental disorders such as cerebral palsy and mental retardation, degenerative diseases of adulthood such as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, metabolic diseases, cerebrovascular diseases such as stroke. You know, stroke is the number one killer in our nations. Well, actually heart disease and stroke I think is about third. Uh, trauma. A lot of times we don't think about brain injuries. You know, we think that you have to lose consciousness in order for there to be a brain injury, but that is not true. You can sustain a brain injury even if you do not lose consciousness. And in fact, scans of the brain can show brain damage to an individual who sustained consciousness through some kind of accident. That is why it is so important, again, if you have children who are playing high intensity contact sport, please be diligent in watching out for their brain health. Um, there are other imbalances, such as infectious diseases, such as AIDS that affect the brain. And then also, last but not least, you have brain tumors. Now, Dementia is also considered a cerebrovascular disease, but not a specific type. In general, it is used to describe a decline in mental ability. Dementia describes a wide range of symptoms, and it's a considered to have at least two of the following symptomologies. A decline in memory, communication in language, ability to focus and pay attention, reasoning and judgment, and visual perception. 
Dementia is caused by the brain cell damage, which impairs communication in the brain and may cause short-term memory loss. Many forms of dementia are progressive, meaning that the symptoms worsen as time go by. Now, while there's no cure per se, for dementia, there are lots of different treatments to help to slow it down and also to reduce the risk of becoming someone afflicted with dementia. Preventative strategies include looking at minimizing cardiovascular risk factors, increasing physical exercise, and definitely looking at adjusting your diet and other lifestyle factors. Another one to consider is Alzheimer's. And Alzheimer's is another degenerative disease, and it is the most common form of dementia, causing problems with memory and thinking and behavior. Over 5 million Americans live with Alzheimer's, and one in 10 people over 65 has Alzheimer's. Early onset Alzheimer's affects approximately 200,000 Americans under the age of 65. Now, minor changes in the brain can occur long before symptoms show. So keep in mind, monitoring the preventive factors, such as an overconsumption of fat and carbohydrate, because interestingly enough, Alzheimer's is now being said to be type 3 diabetes. Did you know that? So it's very important if you or someone you love has insulin resistance to do everything in your power to bring that imbalance into balance. Because if you have insulin resistance in other areas of your body, you can rest assured that you have insulin resistance in the brain, which will lead to different forms of dementia. That's why you have a lot of people who are diabetic or who are insulin resistant, they, they complain of brain fog. You know, they're not able to think clearly. They forget things and things of that nature. These are initial signs that there's something wrong. And do not be satisfied with drugs that artificially lower your blood glucose. Because even though you may be lowering your blood glucose with things like um, injection, insulin injections and metformin and things of that nature, that is not doing anything for reversing the underlying imbalance, which is insulin resistance that can lead, as I said, to Alzheimer's. So the risk of Alzheimer's is doubled in type 2 diabetics. And heart disease also increases your risk of dementia because the arterial stiffness that is related to the buildup of plaque in your cardiovascular system and the rest of your body, well, guess what? It's doing the same thing in your brain. And this is a hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. Now, as I said, another one of the top killers in our nation is stroke. A stroke is considered an attack on the brain. A stroke occurs by the obstruction of blood flow to the brain. This causes the brain cells to die from lack of oxygen. The effects of stroke are dependent on where it hits in the brain because one side of the brain controls the opposite side of the body. Different functions may be impaired. So a stroke that occurs on the right side may lead to paralysis on the left side of the body, vision problems, quick inquisitive behavioral style and memory loss. A stroke that occurs on the left side of the brain may lead to paralysis on the right side of the body, impairment of speech and language, slow, cautious behavior style, and memory loss. What many people do not realize is that 800,000 new or reoccurring strokes happen annually in this country up to 80% of the strokes can be prevented. And stroke is the fifth leading cause of death in the United States. And it is also the leading, leading cause of disability in our nation. So 
What I want to start thinking about also, as I said, is a lot of times we think about brain health and we focus on old folks, right? But I want you to also be looking out for signs in your children, your grandchildren, your nieces, your nephews, the young people, because as I said, I have recently been dealing with the challenges of mental illness in my own son, who is very young. And I also dealt with that for my daughter who had those symptomology and imbalances all of her life, but I adopted her when she was in her teens. Now, I wanna first talk about some myths, right? Myth number one, people say prevention doesn't work. It's impossible to prevent mental illness. That's a bunch of hooey, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. Myth number two, therapy and self-help are a waste of time. Why bother when you can just take a pill? Again, a bunch of hooey. There's so much you can do to reverse imbalances without taking a pill. Myth number three, people with mental health problems can just snap out of it if they try hard enough. It's just in their heads. No, I want to stress to you, when there is a mental illness, there are physiological, biochemical imbalances beneath those symptomologies that you see on the surface. They can't just talk themselves out of depression. You have to deal with the biochemistry. Please, please, please understand that. Myth number four, there is no hope for people with mental health problems. Oh my God, that is the biggest myth that there is. Wrong, wrong, wrong. As a parent or a grandparent, you always want what is best for your child or grandchildren. So I'm gonna make some suggestions for neurological problem prevention, okay? First, let's look at nutrition. Be sure to provide local organic produce and reduce the intake of pesticides. Ensure that these young people with developing brains are drinking lots of water to remove the toxins that you can't get rid of. And avoid heavily processed foods, trans fats, high sugars, and artificial sweeteners. Oh, this one caught me. Like I was, I went out there and I, I thought I was going to do something special for my kids and I got them these um, spritzers because, you know, they're, I thought, water and, and just, I thought it was going to have stevia because it said zero sugar. So I brought it home and silly me, I, I, I was in a rush and I didn't look at the labels and I brought it home and what do you know, it had aspartame. Oh my God, one of the most detrimental chemicals to brain development. So you, you know I was not a happy camper. In any case, make sure that you do everything possible to ensure a toxin-free environment. Utilizing natural cleaners around your home, avoid fabrics treated with flame retardants, look for natural fiber furniture, and please, if at all possible, get an air filter for your house. Also, look for signs of skin irritants. Use natural sunscreens to avoid exposure to chemicals. And if you have a baby, use cloth diapers. I use cloth diapers for all my little babies, right? To avoid exposure to chemicals and that is used inside of those disposable diapers. I know it may seem like an extra hassle but if at all possible, consider using cloth diapers. Plus it's better for environment and trust me when I say it is better for your pocketbook. Next, look at your dentistry. If possible, find a holistic dentist and avoid the overuse of fluoride and avoid mercury containing fillings. Now, last but not least, encourage healthy development. Get your child away from the screens, okay? outside, encourage frequent physical exercise, 
and incorporate brain gym exercises. I love brain gym exercises. I do one particular one in, with all of the people that I work with, which is Carl, the heart lockup. And it's about overlapping the hands and bringing it to the heart center, but phenomenal. So be sure to look up brain gym. You can find books on this on Amazon and things of that nature. And as I said, limit screen time. So now let's talk about some wonderful things we can do for adult prevention, because most of you on looking at this are adults, I am assuming. Now, the World Health Organization published a report that states that it is possible to prevent mental disorders by addressing issues such as work, housing, childcare, education, among other things. Now, let's look at the strategies. Keep good physical health, challenge your brain, do something new and different, as much as possible, learn a new language, do crossword puzzles, learn a new skill, go dancing, learn how to do dancing, things of that nature. Um, learn anger management, or should I say self-regulation, control and manage stress, nurture your relationships, take time to go out for fun and leisure, work on your self-esteem, think positive, you know, one of the things that Dr. Amen talks about is what we call automatic negative thoughts. He refers to them as the ants. So a lot of what I do with people is helping them to identify and eradicate the ants. And that can be one of the most significant gifts that you can give yourself. So think positive, sleep well. I cannot impress upon you enough the importance of sleep and there are a number of lifestyle habits that you can adopt to maintain brain health. Lifestyle changes can be broken down into four categories. Physical health and exercise, diet and nutrition, cognitive activity, and social engagement. I know that's like the bad word these days, but I'm gonna talk about it anyway. These categories have been shown to be reliably able to help keep your body and brain healthy to potentially reduce your risk of cognitive decline. And research has found that combining activities of each category has a great impact on maintaining and improving brain health more than any single activity. So we're gonna discuss different ways to incorporate each of these activities into your lifestyle. You ready? I'm ready. So first and foremost, break a sweat. Many studies have found an association between physical exercise and reduced decline of cognitive ability. In fact, they have found that exercise is at least, if not more effective than medication in reducing the symptoms of depression. Yes, you heard right. Instead of popping 50 million pills, it is possible to get yourself out of that slump through exercise because when you exercise, you start pumping your blood through your body and you start to release those wonderful neurotransmitters that make you feel good without the drugs. And physical activities can be found, can, sorry, can be both mentally and socially engaging. Try walking with a friend, yes. I am telling you to go walking with a friend. Go join a dance class. Make up your own dance class. Have folks come over and y'all dance in your living room for all I care. Join an exercise group. Go golfing. Take tennis lessons. Go walking with your dog. Go for a bike ride. In fact, the World Health Organization says that adults aged 18 to whatever should do at least 150 minutes of exercise each week. Aerobic activities can be performed in little 10 minute sessions, what I call burst fitness. And at least two days a week, muscle strengthening ac activities should be included. Now tips on physical activity is that it should be daily. Don't think that, okay, I'm not going to walk for six days out of the week, and on day seven, I'm going to try and get in all 150 minutes of walking. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying to spread it out through the week, 
And if at all possible, do a little each day, each day. Tips on incorporating physical activity include thinking about your leisure time activities, such as gardening, and like I said, dancing, and hiking, and swimming, and walking. Think about minimizing your transportation and walking instead. You know, <laughs> it's funny to me, and, and, I, and I'm guilty of this, I have to admit, how much we are so trained to try to find the parking space that is closest to the store that we're trying to go into, right? And I have to admit, it, I have to really consciously make an effort to park away from the door in order to encourage myself to be more physically active. But anyway, looking at also at household chores, such as vacuuming and cleaning your windows and dusting, all of that gets your body moving, gets your blood pumping. So it's a good thing. Now, another thing to consider is Old dogs can learn new tricks. In fact, continuing education at any stage of life will help to reduce your risk of cognitive, cognitive decline. And do you know that in New York State, at least when I was in New York State, they actually had a program wherein seniors who were over, I believe, 65 could go to the university free of charge. And that was phenomenal. There were so many people who went back to school and got degrees in the air, in the later stages of life. And it was beautiful to see these seniors walking across the stage in their caps and gowns, absolutely beautiful. But the reason why we're stressing it here is because this will help to reduce signs of cognitive decline. And you have great resources. You have libraries, community centers, rec centers, local colleges, online. I mean, you can sign up to learn anything in the world practically now these days. And even if you don't sign up for an official course, you can go to YouTube and you can learn different things. Um, and the amount of audible books, you know, for those of you who may have issues with uh, being able to visually read books themselves, you can listen to the books and therefore improve your understanding of a new topic some fun ideas include going to the local craft store or home improvement store for classes. I love going to Home Depot. I mean, I'm, I'm like Home Depot chick. And I love their little workshops that they have on weekends. Look for books on cooking or making your own kombucha tea and other and ferments and things of that nature. Teach yourself to sew, to knit, to crochet. Go to your local church or other senior clubs to do different activities, gardening, and join different groups that may be in your community or even online. Now, some of you may not want to hear this, but we've got to talk about this. In order to have brain health, some things have to go. One of the main things is smoking. Now, there are a lot of reasons to kick this habit. You know, decreasing of cognitive decline is yet one other reason because evidence shows that smoking increases the risk of cognitive decline. So now here are some tips to help. Find a reason that will motivate you to kick the habit and get prepared because going cold turkey does not work for many. So it's important to choose your method and set up a support support system, more important than anything else. Replacement therapy, such as nicotine gum, may help some people with withdrawal symptoms. And find new ways of reducing stress, because one of the things that sabotages the efforts of a lot of people is that they don't set up contingencies. You know that people who smoke, a large amount of them, smoke as a stress reliever. So you can't just Throw away the cigarette smoke and not have a backup plan of how you're going to deal with the stressors, which will inevitably come. So make sure you have a backup plan and learn different stress management techniques. And avoid triggers in the first week. So if you associate smoking with drinking and being social in certain environments, then avoid those environments and avoid those triggers. And try to take a walk 
during times when you are most likely to engage in trigger activities. So now let's talk about taking care of your heart because your brain is more likely to follow. Studies show that risk factors for cardiovascular disease and strokes, such as obesity, high blood pressure, and diabetes, negatively impact your cognitive health. That's why it's important to protect your brain by protecting your heart and maintaining healthy blood pressure, cholesterol, and blood sugar levels, and healthy weight. A healthy diet and regular exercise are key to heart protection. So now, as you know, cholesterol is a substance in the blood and it is needed for a healthy body. But if it gets too high because of meats and dairy, and I say that because they are not found in plants, cholesterol is not found in plants, and it is also made by the liver, particularly in people who are insulin resistant, meaning people who have high blood sugar because that sugar gets converted in the liver to fats, right? And there are two types, there are different types of cholesterol. There is LDL and HDL. We want to make sure that your LDL and your HDL levels are appropriate, particularly your HDL levels. So check with your doctor. And if you're having difficulties with that, let me know because I can help you to gain access to blood chemistry panels so that you can find out what your numbers are and adjust your lifestyle and diet accordingly. Also keep in, into, in, keep in mind blood pressure because again, blood pressure is associated with a higher risk of dementia and other forms of mental illness. Now, as I said before, what many people do not think about when it pertains to mental illness is brain injury. And it's not about the loss of consciousness. It's about the impact of the brain because the brain is, is not hard. You know, it's mushy, the consistency of soft tofu. And when you rattle it or you slam it or you shake it, or you fall, guess what? It's rattling inside your skull. And the interior part of your skull has these little ridges that mix into the different parts of the brain and causes damage, even though it may not be perceived immediately. These damages can accumulate and then quote unquote, all of a sudden, you start to notice certain signs of mental imbalance. So please wear a seatbelt, take precautions, use a helmet when you're riding a bike, and take steps to avoid falls. And for me, I, I'm, I'm going to just put it out there and some of you be mad with me. Don't put your children in harm's way by having them run around in the field, smashing their heads into each other. And this is just the mama son in me, but and like I said, you know, people will be upset with me, but hey, so be it. And last but not least, let's look at sleep because not getting enough sleep due to conditions such as insomnia or sleep apnea may result in problems with memory and thinking. Insomnia can be caused by psychiatric and medical, medical conditions and unhealthy sleep habits and specific substances and biological factors. So some conditions that can cause insomnia include nasal and sinus allergies, arthritis, asthma, chronic pain, low back pain. Now ways that you can improve your night's sleep is to avoid using your computer or your phone right before bedtime. Come up with some kind of bedtime routine, you know, such as warm, rest, warm, sorry, restful stretches, warm baths or showers, meditation, reading a book to calm your nerve, and avoid caffeinated beverages in the latter part of the day. Another thing to consider 
is that there is a significant connection between mental health and stress. Stress is a natural response. It helps us to respond quickly to dangerous situations. However, sometimes stress gets out of control and the body stays in that fight or flight response, which can be harmful to brain health. We all handle stress differently. The key is determining your personal tolerance for different situations because stress can cause physical, mental, emotional, and behavioral disorders that can affect your overall health, vitality, peace of mind, as well as your personal and professional relationships. Now, stress can lead to emotional changes and it can intensify feelings of anxiety, fear, anger, sadness, frustration, and behavioral changes may also be experienced, such as being withdrawn, indecisive, and inflexible. You may even experience bodily changes that result in headaches and nausea and indigestion. So think about how is stress affecting you? And think about different ways that you can improve the way in which you respond to stress. Now, one of the ways to, in, to respond to stressful situations is to become more socially engaged because that can help you to support healthy brain function. Pursue social activities that are meaningful to you. And some ways to get socially active are things like volunteering, joining a club, going to a local park to see if they need gardening volunteers. Animal shelters are always looking for caretakers, join a choir, a book club, and things of that nature. And I want to encourage you to challenge yourself. Challenge yourself to do something new, such as working on a puzzle, learning a new skill, participating in strategic games like chess, learning how to play an instrument, do something artistic like painting or scrapbooking, read a different style of book, read poetry or even write poetry and do some journaling. Now, some things to also consider are brain foods, things that will make your brain healthier because nutrition is a huge part of any health regimen, including brain health. Now, typically eating a well-balanced diet includes a high intake of fruits and vegetables that are low in meaty fats and sugar, and this can help to reduce cognitive decline. Diets such as the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet can also contribute to lowering your risks. The Mediterranean diet is a heart healthy diet that protects the brain and incorporates different principles of healthy eating that are typically found in areas around the Mediterranean Sea. And they focus on fruits and vegetables and nuts and grains. They replace butter with healthy oils such as olive oil. They reduce red meat intake. They use herbs to flavor food rather than salt. And they eat fish at least twice a week, such as tilapia, cod, haddock, catfish, and one fatty fish, such as salmon, albacore tuna, mackerel, and sardines. Healthy fats are important because the brain is made up largely of fat and the body cannot manufacture essential fatty acids that are key to brain develop and brain maintenance. Therefore, you need a diet that is rich in omega-3 fatty acids. And as I said, these, food, they, sorry, these foods include salmon and herring and sardines and mackerel and seaweed and avocado and flaxseed and chia seeds and hemp seeds and walnuts. And last but not least, whole grains whole grains such as bulgur, oats, wild rice, barley, beans, and soy. And let's not forget your dark green leafy vegetables, your spinach, your romaine, your turnip, your mustard greens, your broccoli, which are high in B vitamins that are, are absolutely essential in the creation of various neurotransmitters. And a deficiency in B vitamin has been linked to higher rates of depression, fatigue, and insomnia. Last but not least, fermented foods, because fermented foods help to balance the gut bacteria. And the gut is considered to be the second brain because it actually is the location where we 
produce the neurotransmitters. Many people don't realize that. So for instance, 70% of your serotonin is produced in your gut. So if you want to have that calm and that peace in your demeanor, you need to produce serotonin. And if your gut is in disarray, you're not going to be producing serotonin at the levels that you need. So healthy fermented foods can boost the production of anti-anxiety and anti-stress hormones by feeding the healthy gut bacteria. And these types of foods include things like kefir and kimchi and tempeh and sauerkraut. Yummy, yum, yum. Now, another thing that you may want to look at are supplements. Now, here are some essential oils that can have a beneficial effect on brain health. Bergamot, which can be used for calming anxiety. Cinnamon, that can boost self-esteem and confidence. Chamomile is known for calming anger and anxiety. Supplements that help are fish oils, like we said, that contain essential fatty acids for maintaining the structure and function of your brain and have a whole host of anti and anti-inflammatory effects. Then resveratrol, this is a powerful antioxidant that is found in deep purple and red colored fruits. Some studies show that resveratrol could prevent the deterioration of the hippocampus where your memories are stored. Ginkgo bilboa, this is an herbal supplement that can increase blood flow to the brain and therefore increase brain power, yay. And then things like rhodiola, is a powerful supplement used in Chinese medicine to promote well-being and healthy brain function. And phosphatidylserine is a type of fat found in the brain. And some studies show that this supplement can be useful in preserving brain health. So I have been talking about lots of different information. And when you go to your email, you will see tomorrow I will include a recording of this presentation along with the resources that I have used to make this particular presentation. I encourage you to go through those resources, click on all those links and try some of those resources. Now, you have made it to the end of this presentation. You have rocked it. Thank you, thank you, thank you for choosing to focus on your brain health and know that I am looking forward to hearing from you. Feel free to contact me by either going to our website, giving me a call at 850-725-8322, or emailing me at sankofahe at gmail.com. And as I said, for those of you who registered for this particular presentation, tomorrow you'll receive a, an email with the recording as well as the resources and you can feel free to respond to that email if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. Remember that it's not goodbye. It is just until we meet again.